What's up, sons? It's Blindrod with Sonvatech once again, and today I just picked up a Trezor 1 and wanted to go ahead and give you guys a quick review of it as well as a quick start guide, so let's get into it. Alrighty, so if you guys aren't aware of what a hardware wallet is, essentially it's a device that's supposed to keep your cryptocurrency extra secure as opposed to keeping it on an always online wallet like a hot wallet, aka, that you have installed on your desktop. So essentially that's what this is. The other competitor is going to be the Ledger. And now Trezor also has a new model called the Model T, which actually has a touch screen on the front, but they are all sold out right now. I will be going over the Ledger, a Nano S in particular as well, and then trying to get my hands on a Model T if I can. If you guys know where I can pick one up, of course, let me know in the comment section below and I'll pick one up as soon as possible. That aside, let's talk about the Trezor One. The Trezor One uses an ARM processor, specifically the Cortex-M3. It measures 60 millimeters by 30 millimeters by six millimeters thick. And so it's a pretty good size for fitting into your pocket. However, of course, I don't recommend keeping these in your pocket. We'll get into more of that later. And a micro USB cable is included with it. You will need one to interface with your PC. The operating support is Windows, OS X, Linux, and then on the mobile side, Android only. So no iOS support here. If you're rocking an iPhone, which I highly recommend if you're kind of just wanting to stay as secure as possible at the same time, you know, not having to dive into rolling your own kernel or anything like that on Android. I am an Android fan, you know, just getting it out of the way. I use a S7 in particular, but for a lot of people, I do recommend iOS just because they're a little bit easier to keep secure. Now that being said, here's the coin support because you guys need to have this list for you, of course. So here we go. As far as everything that's supported by the Trezor wallet built in here, you're going to have Bitcoin, Litecoin, Dash, Zcash, Bitcoin Trash, I mean cash, yeah, cash. Yeah, that's right. And Bitcoin Gold. So you're going to have all of those options, of course, right out of the box. And then if you're wanting to go ahead and integrate some other coins, you have that option with my Ether wallet. And there's some guides on the website that you can check out that are pretty easy to follow. And the coins that are supported through the Ether wallet is going to be Ethereum, Ethereum Classic, ERC-20 tokens, so all of the tokens on the Ethereum blockchain, of course, Expanse and Ubeek. Now, keep in mind that, yes, Ethereum and Ethereum Classic are already built into the device, so you're not going to have to go out and actually integrate with my Ether wallet. But if you're going to do Ubeek, you're going to have to go ahead and get that set up at a later time. It's not going to come pre-installed and ready to go. Now, as far as the rest of the coins to round things out, it does support NEM on the Nano wallet, so you're going to have to integrate with that. It does support Namecoin, no interface in particular with this one, and Dogecoin as well. So those are all the coins that it supports. If you're looking for other ways and manners of protecting your other cryptocurrencies, I don't know, like a long-term hold of Verge, then of course you're going to have to look into other options for this, which I will be trying to cover for you guys here in the future. Just give me some time as I catch up on some of these videos. So now let's go ahead and go over the setup. It's pretty straightforward and we're going to hop into it right over here. Now, one of the things I was initially disappointed with is that it does require an online connection. Now, I do know that pretty much all of the passcodes and everything that gets displayed for recovery is going to be on the device itself, but that is connected to a computer via your USB, which has to be hot. And by hot, I mean it has to have an internet connection. I would prefer that it had an offline solution or an application that I could download, install, and then disconnect from the internet before I connect my device to my PC because no matter what, somebody will always figure out a way to get past all of this. However, like I stated, all of the passcodes and everything will be displayed on the device so it is technically still secure. Alrighty, so the first thing you're going to want to do is head on over to trezor.io start and select Trezor 1 for your option. 
At this point, it's going to load up and actually ask you to download the bridge and install. So you'll click download for the operating system of your choice, which is Windows, OS X, or Linux, depending on what you're looking for there. And you're just gonna click save file and go through the install process. And once that's complete, the bridge will actually not open the application. It's just gonna run the bridge in the background of your operating system. So keep that in mind that that's how that's working. You're gonna navigate back to trezor.io slash start. And at this point, you're gonna be able to go through the firmware updates. Now, if you are updating, keep in mind that the version 1.4 and up will also offer a really neat feature for essentially a hardware two-factor authentication. This can work for your two-factor for things like your exchanges, as well as even something like as simple as Dropbox or Google. So that's a pretty neat feature that they added with that particular firmware, and I highly recommend utilizing that over something like your phone, where your phone can easily be breached uh, this is a better option or a, a safer option for it. Now, once the firmware is completed installing on the device, it should say complete installing, completed installing. However, on the web GUI, it says, please reconnect Trezor. What I had to do here is unplug and plug it back in. Now verify that on the device, it says that it's been set up. Next, you're gonna be ready to create your new wallet and you can recover if you need to, but here we're just gonna be creating a new wallet. So click the create new wallet button, and then you are ready to pretty much go off to the races. At this point, the next step you're gonna to wanna to take is going ahead and creating a backup file. And at this point, you're just gonna have pretty much your recovery seed is the backup key to all your cryptocurrencies. Do not take a picture of it. You just wanna make sure you click the I understand and then get ready to write down your recovery seed. So on your Trezor wallet, you will see a unique combination of 24 words and this is going to be your recovery seed for the Bitcoin wallet. Of course, you need to do this for the individual coins as well. And at this point, you're just going to click the next button on your Trezor wallet and let it go through all 24 words. You're gonna to wanna to write these down now you can write them down on the included sheet of paper, but that's not very secure as far as hazards. So fire, water, etc., is going to be an issue here. What I would recommend getting as opposed to this is something like the key stack, which I have not reviewed on the channel because they're currently out of them, but it comes with an etcher and you can actually etch the words onto a metal plate, which will keep it more secure and, you know, prevent loss in the case of a fire or some other disaster, a flood and so on. So keep your keys as safe as possible. If you are putting it on paper, put it in a fireproof safe and move on from there. So to complete the backup, it's gonna ask you to name your device. And it does say, you know, by customizing the name, you'll be able to tell whose is whose. So when you plug it in, it'll show the name. You know, if you're at a Bitcoin conference or something like that, and you get yours mixed up with somebody else's, then you're gonna be able to look at the name itself and easily recover it as fast as possible. Now, at this point, you're going to want to enter a new pin after this. And one of the great things about this is that it randomizes the location of the numbers on the device itself. So when you look at your device, it'll have nine numbers. Unfortunately, there's no number for zero or no number for zero. There's no zero option. So you're gonna have to adjust, you know, whatever your pin is if you're used to using one for zero. But even if your pin is insecure, it is gonna be nice to know that it's randomizing the input. So one and two and three are not always on the bottom row. The other thing that this help pre helps prevent is that if somebody is in a remote session on your computer without your knowing about it, they aren't gonna be able to tell which numbers you're actually choosing for the device. So if they were gathering information for later to steal your Trezor hardware wallet, they aren't gonna be able to get the actual pin off of watching you from a remote session without your knowledge. After that, they're just gonna ask you for an email for your their newsletter. This is up to you. 
you can always click the skip this step and continue on, which is what I recommend doing. But, you know, if you want to get their newsletter to get, you know, early hands on the Model T, which I wish I would have done, it can be nice as far as all of that goes. Now to receive anything, all you have to do is select the coin in the top left that you want to receive. And then at that point, you can just click the receive tab on the right side and it'll give you your address. Now, one of the things that I didn't really like is that it didn't give me a QR code to scan on the actual web page. And it does put the QR code on the Trezor device itself, but that's a little hard to scan because it is a very tiny screen. So if they would have put that, you know, within the web GUI, it would have made transactions a little bit easier. However, maybe there's some sort of security concern there that I'm not fully aware of because I feel like that should only be pulling your address. So I don't think it would be bad to add that in as an option. So once you've actually sent something to that device, you can plug it in and then see your account, of course, and its balance. For example, I have up here about 0.03 Bitcoin deposited to this device. And then if you head on over to the send tab, you can actually go ahead and send your Bitcoin from that device. And it even has a little QR code reader in case you have a webcam or something like that that you want to use to go ahead and make, you know, the send transaction. So at least the QR code readers in there making, you know, sending from the particular device a little bit easier. So that's going to wrap up a quick overview as well as a quick start guide for the Trezor one. And hopefully, like I said, we'll get some other devices that we can take a look at and compare and contrast. Some of the negatives or downsides for me is that it doesn't have a separate application that you can download to a device and then keep offline at all times. I understand for ease of use, this probably comes across as the best way. But if there was at least two options, one where you could actually turn it hot when you want to and then generate the address offline just for, you know, extra layer of security of keeping everything offline. That'd be really cool. I still think there's some better options. You can generate a Bitcoin address offline and keep it in something like a key stack only. And that's a really good option, but I understand that this is a little bit more user friendly for a lot of people that are new to it. One of the greatest things that I like about this device in particular is it's an all in one kind of go to device for my major cryptocurrencies, as well as any other two factor authentication that I feel like I want to have. And I don't have to have a separate USB device for that in particular. So props on that support there. And I'll keep you up to date if any new coins are added. If there's a particular coin that I mentioned earlier that you know you can add support for, that you want support for, let me know if you need a guide on that in the comment section below. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and I will see you next Tuesday.